<laughs> All right, now in this, in this psalm here, of course we have the very famous uh, first verse there, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And, and this isn't what the sermon's about necessarily, but, but you ought to be happy to come to church. Amen. And, and I love coming to church. I love preaching in church. And, and there's, it's, one, it's a really fun thing for me. And hopefully you feel the same way too. Um, that's not just a drudgery, but that you're happy. You want to learn more about God. You like singing the praises. You like fellowshipping with the people in the house of the Lord. But um, what I'm really going to be focusing on tonight is something that, that you hear in so many walks of Christianity just in general. People will say this phrase, they'll say, Pay, or pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? You hear it all over the place. I mean, it's, it's, it's across denominations. It's a real popular saying. And um, what I want to do tonight is look into this a little bit and just see scripturally, should we be doing that today? Should um, we be doing that as a nation? And because um, I, I believe that, that there's this, it's basically, it's called Zionism where people put up on a pedestal the, this nation of Israel that exists today. This nation that was, that was essentially created in 1948 by the United Nations, that nation of Israel that's there today. People believe that this state, that this, this, this nation that was created in 1948, that exists as it is today, that somehow we ought to be praying for the, for the, for the peace of, of Jerusalem and what they, where they get that from is from Psalm 1 and 22, verse 6. So let's take a look at it real quick. We're going to look at it in depth. Because what I think this does, this gets us into a lot of trouble with, especially with politics and with our wars and with all these other things where we're getting our nose involved, where it really ought not to be involved. But, but let's just look at this because we, we need to have a biblical perspective. If, if, if this is something that we need to do, then this is something that we need to do. And if it's not, then it's not, but we need to just get what we understand, what we believe from the Bible. So you see in verse 6 of Psalm 122, he says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Right? So right there, if you just take that one verse, you can say, okay, well, David's saying, you know, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and that they will prosper that love thee. And, and what people will take that to understand is just that, okay, well, if we want to prosper... We're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But what's really important is that you have to take the entire chapter in context. Mm -hmm. And again, the first verse says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He's starting off talking about the house of the Lord. And look at how he finishes in the last verse. He says, well, let's start with verse 6, right? From pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper and love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. Again, more of just a blessing, just kind of saying we want peace there within the walls, prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say peace be within thee. So my brethren are there, my companions are there. That's why I'm saying peace be within you. And at the very end, verse 9, because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. The house of the Lord, the temple, existed in Jerusalem. Back in these times, back in the time when, when these psalms are being written down, the house of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, existed in Jerusalem, which is why he's saying we should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for the prosperity, pray for all this stuff, because God's house is there. That's where God's house exists. And in context, the whole reason behind these blessings and why we should be praying for that is because God's house is there. That's the reason why, why, we even, why we would even do this. Now, is God's house in Jerusalem today? It doesn't exist. Anymore. It's been destroyed. The temple's been destroyed, right? And of course, now in the Old Testament, they would go to the temple. There were the sacrifices. That was considered God's house. But in the New Testament today, the local church is God's house. Right. We're in God's house tonight. So if you want to be praying for the peace for people, pray, pray for God's people. Right. Pray for our peace. Pray for, the, for you know, where, where God's house is. But, but what the big problem we have is when people just kind of take verses out of context and will just tell you that this is what we need to do. And there's an entire agenda behind this. Now we're going to go ahead, if you would, please, and turn to Genesis chapter number 12. We're going to go in a little bit more in depth, not just praying for the peace, but just in general... Um, kind of the state of Israel and, and what involvement we ought to have with them and, and 
how we ought to be dealing with them today. And this is this is something that that is a it might be unpopular today if you look at, at Christianity as a whole. But again, I, I'm not as concerned about popularity as I am just with what the Bible says and and, and, and knowing what we ought to be doing as Christians because I don't want to be not doing something I should be doing, but I also don't want to be involved in something that, that maybe we shouldn't be involved with. Genesis chapter 12, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, again, the Zionist movement, one of the big arguments that they'll use, and one of the big reasons that they'll say, well, the United States needs to be supporting Israel, they need to be helping Israel, they need to be doing all this stuff for Israel, they bring it down to this verse of a promise that was given to Abraham. First of all, Abraham is the progenitor of Israel, but these blessings that we see, this is something that God is, is, is talking to Abraham and giving him these blessings. And he's saying, look, you're going to be blessed. You know, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to be a father of many nations. He says in verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Notice this now. Because in the King James Bible, we have these, these, these old archaic words like thou and thee and ye and, you know, these really difficult to understand words. But they're there for a reason. And what they do is they, for one thing, what they do, I'll just, just to help you understand this, in case you didn't know, thou and thee are singular. It means you're talking to one person. That means, it, and it basically just means you. Okay, I could be talking to someone. If I say thou, that means I'm talking to this one person. But if I were to say ye, like as in this whole group of you, I'm speaking to all of you. That's what it means. Okay, so if that's your hang up on the King James Bible, then, then, then get started reading the King James Bible because that's all it means. It's very simple. But it's also important to understand that because when we look at this and it's the Bible says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. He's talking to Abraham. And he's saying anyone that's, that's going to curse Abraham, God's going to curse that, that, those people, those nations. And you see that in Abraham's life throughout Genesis. As he's going into different, different nations and different areas, God's protecting him. God's looking out for him. So he's saying, look, if anyone's going to be against you, then basically they're against me. And, but if anyone blesses you, hey, I'll bless them too. And that's the way that God dealt with Abraham. But... It does not, this is not, I believe it would be a big stretch to just say because God gave this blessing and this, this promise to Abraham that all of a sudden now that applies to the nation of Israel that we have today just because Israel was a, was a descendant of Abraham physically in the flesh. And it's interesting too because if you look at verse number three, look at the end of verse number three, it says, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. It doesn't say shall one nation be blessed, and in these shall only only one particular group of people be blessed. It says, All families of the earth will be blessed through thee. So again, and, and this this kind of gets into God's people a little bit and, and who we should be praying for, but this is kind of interesting. Uh, you could turn where do I want you to turn? Turn if you would to Jeremiah chapter number 14. I'm going to read 2 Chronicles in verse 18, or chapter 18, sorry. Because in 2 Chronicles 18, we have a story. We have the King Ahab, which was the king of Israel, and then we have Jehoshaphat, which was the king of Judah. In those days, the, 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 the nation of Israel was divided into, into two nations. You had, you had Judah and you had, you had the, um, the king of Israel. And Ahab was a wicked king. But he was the king of Israel. And what he did, in 2 Chronicles 18.3, it says, And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people is thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. So Jehoshaphat yokes up with the wicked king of Israel, Ahab. And he says, you know what? You know, king Ahab goes to him looking for help in a war. 
Joshua says, yeah, we'll be with you. We're going to go to war with you. We'll help you out. But in 2 Chronicles 19, Joshua, Joshua shouldn't have done that. He gets rebuked in 2 Chronicles 19, in verse number 1. The Bible says, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. So, you know, the war goes bad. Ahab gets killed. Jehoshaphat returns back, but he returns back in peace. And then it says in verse 2, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So he's saying, look, should you love the ungodly? Should you go and help them that hate God? This is in reference to Israel. This is the nation, and this is in the Old Testament. This is in the, in the, the in context talking specifically about Israel. Now, if God said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee, and he was talking about the nation of Israel, well, we got a big problem here <laughs> because he was told not to have anything to do with them. And not only that, he said, basically said that they hate the Lord. He was helping a nation. The nation of Israel at that time under King Ahab hated the Lord, according to the Bible, according to Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer. That's right. This is something, again, we need to, to make sure that we, <laughs> when we're interpreting the Bible, when we're looking at this stuff, Take it as a whole, for one, and make sure that we're comparing it with other scriptures to see what does this really talk about. And when people try to make a stretch and say, well, yeah, I know we gave that to Abraham, but that really just means Israel because it's, you know, hold on a second. You know, let's just check it out. You're in Jeremiah chapter 14. Look at what it says in verse number 10. Mind you, these are God's own words. In verse number 10 it says, thus saith the Lord unto this people. This is God speaking. These are God's words. Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. And again, he's talking about Israel. He says, look, pray not for this people for their good. But what about Psalm 122.6, you know? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Well, look, we have to understand the context and why you would even do that. Why would you pray for him? Now, don't get me wrong tonight, okay, because don't get the spirit of this sermon wrong tonight. I have the same spirit that Paul did in Romans 10 when he said, um, wow, put him on the spot in our memory verse, and I'm not even getting the verse. <laughs> Brother, my heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. Okay. This is not an anti-Jewish or anti-Israel in a sense, you know, like like as a as a people, like like just trying to bring them down. What it is though is that I, I need people to understand that we shouldn't just have this this over love of Israel and, and put them up on a pedestal because of verses that are taken out of context. Now, if you could show me other verses that say why we should be doing something, you know, aiding them or helping them or whatever we should be doing, then, then fine, if, if it's not, you know, based on what we covered today. And again, if it's in the Bible, amen, let's follow it. But, but what I'm trying to do tonight is show you some of, the, some of these arguments that are used by people to give our support, because I'll tell you what, this has a big impact on this nation. This is leading us into wars. This is leading us into war with wars with people surrounding Israel. And so many Christians today are saying, yes, we should be doing that. We need to be supporting this country. We need to be invading or doing whatever we can to protect this nation that was created by the United Nations in 1948 because they think that that's what God wants them to do. They've been lied to. They think that this is something that as a Christian we ought to be doing. And it's simply not true. And... The big reason why here, turn if you would to Galatians chapter 3, please. And when studying the Old Testament, because a lot of this stuff has to do with Old Testament uh, doctrine, Old Testament promises, covenants that were made in the Old Testament. And any time that we read the Old Testament, we always need to look at the Old Testament through the light of the New Testament. So anytime we want to understand what's going on in the Old Testament, what, whenever possible, whatever it's talking about, try to get the majority of what you believe from the New Testament so you could... You could shed the light on the Old Testament scripture. 
Galatians chapter 3, we're going to be spending a lot of time in Galatians and in Romans. Because this talks, they both talk a lot about the promises given to Abraham and, and how we need to be understanding this. Galatians chapter number 3, if you would look at verse number 6. I'm going to read 6 through 9 and we're going to go through each verse kind of one by one. The Bible reads, Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And again, these are basically the same promises that we were just reading about in Genesis that were given to Abraham. But he's explaining it to us now. Look at verse number six. It says, Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, we see that today as, of course, Abraham was saved by grace through faith. He put his faith on the Lord. He called upon the Lord and got saved. And it was his faith that saved him the same way that people are saved today. We call upon the Lord Jesus Christ in order for us to be saved. We put our faith in him. But let me ask you this. The Jews that are in the nation of Israel today, is their faith on the Lord? Is their faith on Jesus Christ? I would say it's by and large. It's not, I mean, I'm sure there are some saved people living in that geographic area today. But when I, in this sermon now, I'm going to be referring to the Jews. I'm talking about Judaism. I'm talking about a religion. I'm talking about people that are following that Jewish religion over there. They don't believe God. They don't believe on God. They are not saved. And this verse comes to, comes to my mind in John 5, verse 45. It says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. This was Jesus Christ speaking to the, to the people who basically believed in Judaism in his time. That did not believe on Christ. They believed that there was a Messiah, but it wasn't Christ. And this is the same religion, essentially, that we have today. And he's saying, look, they trusted in the law. They were trusting in, in, in their works and in their, in their works for righteousness. It says in verse John 5, 46, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So he's saying, look, you don't even believe Moses. They claim to believe Moses. They claim, hey, we believe in what Moses said. We believe what Moses teaches. Jesus says, no, you don't. Moses wrote of me. If you believe Moses, you would believe me. That you would believe exactly what I'm saying. The same way that we believe Jesus today, we also believe what Moses said. I mean, we, we believe both, and there's no contradiction because it's always been by grace through faith. That's always the way salvation has been. Now let's look at verse 7 of Galatians 3. It says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now, Again, I don't consider those that are in Israel today as those of, that they are which are of faith. Because they're not believing in Christ, they're not believing in the Lord. And this verse says that the children of Abraham are they which are of faith. Hey, if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that includes you. That includes me. We are considered, in God's eyes, we are considered the children of Abraham. So when you look, you have to, it's really important to understand this because when we're looking at the promises made to Abraham by God, those promises were made to him because he had faith. That's why God even, even blessed him and gave him the promise because Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. God gave him this and, and he gave him these promises to his seed after him. And I tell you what, the Bible makes it, it all throughout the New Testament you're going to see, look, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. That's right. If you are a child of faith, you are a child of Abraham. And, and because it's, he's not as concerned about the physical seed as he is with the spirit. Verse 7 is a great verse for that. Verse number 8, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, mm -hmm. preached before the gospel, unto Abraham, saying, And thee shall all nations be blessed. So again, if you still weren't convinced from the first two verses, you know, this one should spell out that, you know, the gospel was preached unto Abraham. We use the word gospel and we think of it as something that's just a New, New Testament thing. We just think of it as just like, well, the gospel is, is, of course, is Jesus Christ 
death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. But I'll tell you what, the people in the Old Testament knew the gospel just as much as we. I mean, they had the same gospel that we had. They just didn't know the name of Jesus Christ. But they knew the gospel. And yes, people have always been saved by the gospel, no matter what year you were born in. It's always been by the gospel. Now, again, I would say, does that nation of Israel that exists today, do they believe the gospel? They don't. Verse number 9, Galatians 3, 9. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. This verse explains that all believers are blessed just as Abraham was blessed. Just as I would just mention that if you're of faith, then you, are, you get to receive the blessings that, that Abraham received of God. <clears throat> and Israel today is not a place that's full of believers in Christ. They're not of faith. So will they receive the blessings that Abraham received if they're not going to believe? I would say no. And, and in fact, the people are over there, the people that believe in a Judaism religion, they believe that there is a Christ. They believe that there's a Messiah and that he's coming, but it's not Jesus. They, re they are essentially their antichrist because they're rejecting, they're, they deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. They, they do not believe that. They're still waiting for their Messiah. And then in Galatians 3.14, it restates basically the same thing. It says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, um, this verse is extremely important to understanding the promises made by God to Abraham, as well as how close you need to look at the words of the Bible when you form your doctrine. Look at verse number 16 of Galatians 3. Because when we read the Bible, I mean, you've you got to read it very carefully. And this kind of spells it out for you. makes it a little bit more plain. But it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, And to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So he makes a very important point to say, Look, he didn't add an S on there. He didn't make it plural. He said, To thy seed. These promises that were made were made to Abraham, and to his seed. So Jesus Christ is who he's talking about that, that was Abraham's seed that also receives these promises that were made unto Abraham. Now let's look at some of these promises that were made to Abraham. I kind of compiled a list. Let's flip back to Genesis 13. We're going to look at a bunch of the promises and, and with this in, in mind, with the light of the New Testament, with what we've just seen in the book of Galatians, Knowing that it says that, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And also looking at, you know, it was, it was, the promises were made not to seeds as of many, but to thy seed, which is Christ. And let's look at some of these promises and see how they play out in light of the New Testament. Look at Genesis chapter 13. And we're going to start reading in, in verse 14. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Jump down, or um, I'm sorry. We're going to turn next to Genesis chapter 15. So here he's saying, look, look at the land which thou see. You know, look to the north, south, east, and west. I'm going to give you all of this land. So this land is going to be yours and to thy seed forever. So this is something I'm giving to you forever, right? And it's important to understand this now. Because there's a lot of people today that will say, well, Israel today still deserves that land that God has laid out for them because he says it's an everlasting covenant. And they're going to say they always just should should have that land and again another reason for us to get involved over there to make sure that they can have their land and that that God's promises are kept here and which is interesting because you know we have to get involved as a nation to make sure God's promises are kept right like 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 that's something that's our job to, to make sure God's promises are kept um, and we'll get to that in a minute Genesis chapter 15 we're going to look at another promise here Genesis 15, look at verse number 18. It says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, 
saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt, unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, and the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So now he's laying it out a little bit more specific. See, back in verse 13, he's saying, okay, just look around north, south, east, and west. I'm going to give you all this land. This land is going to be yours until I see forever. Now, so now he's saying, okay, but a little bit more specifically, God's making a covenant with Abraham, saying, unto thy seed have I given this land. Look at Genesis uh, chapter 17. We're going to see the promises again. So I'm trying to go through, I'm trying to be relatively exhaustive when we're going through these promises that were made to Abraham. Look at Genesis 17 in verse number 1. The Bible says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And again, this is really important to note because God's given him these blessings and he said, you're going to be a father of many nations. He's not saying this one specific nation. He's saying, you're going to be a father of many nations. Okay, and he's in his blood. This is a blessing for him to be a father of many nations. And this is one of the blessings that's come upon him. Look at verse number six. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Now, when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, well, it's an everlasting promise. This is something that's going to last forever. This is something that goes on forever. But he made a covenant with Abraham. Look at verse number nine. And God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after the end of generation. So, now we're starting to see this isn't just a blanket gift that's given to Abraham as a promise. This was a covenant that was made between Abraham and God, where God says, look, this is going to be your land. It's an everlasting possession. I'm going to give it to you. But then he says, thou shalt keep my covenant. So Abraham has to do something. Now, if Abraham doesn't do something, whatever it is, that covenant is going to be broken. Look at verse number 10. It says, This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. So this is a covenant not just between God and Abraham, but between me and you and thy seed after thee. This covenant extends for the generations to come. He says, Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. Now God makes his covenant with Abraham and the covenant was sealed through circumcision. That's what he was using to say, okay, this is a token of the covenant that we've made and he uses circumcision. Now, is that covenant still in effect today? Because I would say if it is, are we still required to, to circumcise our children? Is circumcision a requirement that's, 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 let, that's made for the believer of today? I believe that that covenant was broken a long time ago. And that's why there was a need for a better covenant, one that's not through the law. But, um, you know, this, these promises that God was making to Abraham, they were conditional. I do not believe they were unconditional here. Now, it could have been forever. It could have been everlasting, but... It was a covenant that was made and it was broken. Romans 2, let's flip to Romans real quick because we'll go back to the New Testament now. We saw a lot of these promises that were made to Abraham and to his seed after him. Now, in some of these instances, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go through each one. It's, it, it's, kinda, it's a really in-depth sermon tonight. You're going to have to do some of the study on your own because in some of the instances, you can see where he's talking about his seed is definitely talking about Christ. But in other instances, it is definitely referring to a plural of his descendants coming after him. And I, I simply don't have the time to go through each individual case 
tonight, but it's that, but it's worth looking at, and it's worth looking up yourself, and make a note of that if you'd like to make notes while you're listening to the sermon to look up to see which specific covenants when he's when he's talking about making promises to him are are a little bit more you know more geared where you can say yeah that's that's talking about Christ specifically, but these ones are are obviously talking about more than just one person coming after him. Um, but in either case, you know we've already seen that. If you're a child of faith, you're a child of Abraham and, and receive the blessings as such. Now, Romans chapter 2, verse 25, the Bible says, For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So you look, in order for circumcision to even do you any good, in order for that covenant to do you any good, you have to keep the entire law. And it says in verse two, uh, 26, Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? Look at verse 28. It says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. This is where we really get to see just, just the explanation of, of why a lot, like why these symbols were used. Why do these things even come into place? God knew we couldn't keep the law. God made this covenant, but he's saying, look. You're not a Jew. He doesn't care outwardly. He doesn't care if you're a physical descendant of Abraham. It doesn't matter to him. What he's saying is, you're a Jew which is one inwardly, by faith. The same thing with circumcision. He says the circumcision is not, is not that of the flesh. It's in the heart. It's in the spirit. It's not in the letter. So whose praise is not of men, but of God. Look at Romans chapter 4. We've got a lot of Bible tonight. A lot of, I'm trying to do the best I can with a little bit of running short on time, but there's a, a lot of scripture on this. There's a lot of scripture referring back to Abraham, referring back to those promises in the New Testament and in the Old Testament that, that covers both of these. But um, look, if you would, at Romans chapter 4. Look at verse number 11. It says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Um, <laughs> again, we're seeing here that Abraham received the promise and the covenant of circumcision before he was even circumcised. And, he, and again, one of the reasons he's doing this is because he's trying to explain to the people at the time, they believed that, no, you also have to be circumcised. They, they, they were believing that faith wasn't enough. You had to at least be circumcised and, and have that type of obedience to the law. And he's saying no. He said no. It's, it's completely by faith. Abraham was justified by his faith. And it was before he was even circumcised. That's when he received that promise. That he might be the father of all them believe. And he's talking about though they be not circumcised. Even righteousness is imputed unto them. Unto the heathen that, that, that they believed but they weren't circumcised. Verse number 12 of Romans 4 says. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had, being yet uncircumcised. Verse 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And again, you see the covenant that, that, was, that, is, um, that was made with circumcision is being referred to as a covenant of, of obeying the law. And of, and, of, of, and of following God's laws. That covenant is broken when, like, as soon as the children of Israel rejected God's laws and just start, stopped obeying them and stopped following them, which is the exact reason. I'm like, you could keep on reading Romans 4. I'm, I'm trying to, to there's, there's, there's so much stuff here. Turn if you would to Romans chapter 9. Read the whole chapter of Romans 4 when you get a chance because that talks about a lot. Romans chapter 9 says in verse number 4, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, 
whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God bless it forever, amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall they seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Again, just that much more evidence showing that you know, just like we saw earlier, he is a Jew, not that it was outwardly, but it's one inwardly. They're not all Israel, which are of Israel. So when people are talking about this and, and magnifying this nation of Israel, that is contradictory to what we're seeing here. He's saying, look, he doesn't care about the physical nation of Israel. It's not what matters. What matters is the faith. That's why Abraham was blessed in the first place, because he believed God. That's why all of these people when they receive these blessings, it's because of their great faith that they had, not because they were physical descendants. That, that, that was not what was important. Look, jump down to verse 25 of Romans 9. It says, As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. They'd just be destroyed. Verse number 30, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. So again, he's saying very clearly, look, they were following after the law and trying to obtain the righteousness through the law. They have not attained to the law of righteousness. They, have not, they were not able to live up to that standard. Verse 32, wherefore, why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. My friends, this is going on today in that same nation today. You have the same, the same people rejecting Christ, and they're trying to attain their righteousness through the works of the law. And again, this doesn't mean that we don't love them and that we don't want them to get saved, but they need to get saved. Okay, they don't have any special um, place with God. They have no special status. God's not a respecter of persons. Just because they were born of the physical seed of Abraham, that doesn't give them special privileges. That doesn't give them special access into heaven. That doesn't give them anything special. And that doesn't mean that we should be trying to prop them up and support them as much as possible and give them financial aid and do whatever we can to help that nation when they're a nation of people that don't believe on Christ. They're ungodly. We don't need to be partakers in helping and supporting the ungodly. We see that we're going to bring a curse upon ourselves by doing that. We shouldn't be going and helping the ungodly. And it's not just Israel. There's, <laughs> there are many nations that are ungodly that we ought to have nothing to do with. We don't need to be propping these people up. But that's a whole other story on the empire of what America is, <laughs> the, the empire we've become, getting our noses involved in everybody else's business. Now, all throughout biblical history, all throughout the Bible, we're going to see that after Israel actually inherited that land, God sent, you know, Joshua went in, they fought the battles, they obtained the promised land. They received the promise that was made to Abraham many years earlier. They go in and they finally get it. They finally receive that inheritance, right? There are numerous examples that after they start turning away from God, not you know, going to false gods, going to the to the gods of the heathen of the land that they were supposed to have destroyed, but didn't completely destroy. Anytime they do that, how does God judge them? God brings in invading armies, and he puts them into bondage, and he carries them captive out of their land. That's how God has always dealt with them. When they decide to say, you know what? They get away from God, he goes, Okay, well, now we're gonna bring someone else in to to um, to persecute you. And to, and to take you out of the land that I've already promised you. Now, they lose parts of their nation and, and all throughout the, the Bible and the Old Testament there. And it's clearly explained that God is the one bringing the judgment in on Israel. 
So it appears to me that someone broke the covenant made with God since it already hadn't lasted forever. I mean, he was already taking him out of the land back then. They broke the covenant with him. He said, okay, well, the covenant was for them to stay there forever. I mean, forever is never ending. So if they had already been removed out of the land, then that promise has to have been broken. Now, we know God doesn't break his promises. Like, if he was to give it to them unconditionally, there's no way that could ever have been broken because God's not a liar. But since it was conditional, since it was something that was a covenant that was made with Abraham, sealed through circumcision, based on the works of the law, they, they, didn't, they didn't receive the full promise because they didn't keep their end of the deal. They didn't keep their end of the bargain. Now, I would, if you could know, should, see me after service, if you could show me in the Bible where it says it's the duty of a Christian nation to get involved in the matters of another nation. Because I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen it once yet. Now, I have found verses that explain where it's an individual's responsibility to help other people, okay? And, and, and to be charitable and do other things and to help people out and do all that stuff for the individual. But I don't see anywhere where it's talking about a government or an entire nation's job to be responsible for the welfare or the well-being of another nation that's completely separate from your own. I can't, I've not seen that once in Scripture. Again, the individual's different. The individual, we're supposed to love our neighbor, we're supposed to do all these things, we're supposed to help people out. But it's not the same with a, with a country or with a nation. Now, it seems to me that many Christians today think that we need to step in and do God's work for them. Because they'll look, when it comes to Israel at least, they'll say every time, <laughs> every time Israel would get right with God, see, God would be the one who would bring the victories and drive out the heathen of the land. God is the one that would bring his people out of bondage. So like in the Old Testament, they would go into bondage, they'd be going into captivity. What would happen? They would turn their hearts back to the Lord. And when they would do that, God would send deliverance. God would send someone in and say, okay, I'm going to bring you back into that. Now you're going to have peace. Now you're going to have safety. You know, you've gotten right with me. If the children of Israel that are over there today aren't willing to do that, my friends, there's nothing that we can do. In fact, we would be fighting against God if we're going to be trying to help a nation that wants nothing to do with God, not in the sense of believing Him, not you know, and, and isn't believing Moses, isn't believing Jesus, doesn't have their faith in Him. If we're going to go and just say, you know what, whatever nation it is, we're going to try to just, just get them this land and we're going to fight their battles for them and we're going to do all this stuff and we're going to give them all these arms and we're going to support them. We're going to give them finances. We're going to give them military. We're going to do whatever we can. If God doesn't want them there, we're fighting against God. If God's not going to give that land back because, because they haven't turned to him, then we're fighting against God. And that is not the position that I want to be in. I think that's a, that's, that is a losing battle every single time. We need to stop believing, if you had already, I don't know, that the covenant that was made with Abraham regarding the nation of Israel and their land is still applicable today. Okay, now, I'm not going to say if they, if they were to turn to God and if they were to get their hearts right and just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what? I believe God would probably bless them and God would give them the land to live in. But I believe that that old covenant has been broken and it's gone. We need to stop believing in circumcision. The, the New Testament does away with that. We understand that God is not a racist. We had, to, we had this conversation uh, earlier with uh, Brother Perkins and I about, you know, there's really only one race. If people just get this through their heads, it's the human race. That's it. There's, there is no, you know, God's not a respecter of persons. And we're all, we're all of one blood. We all came from Adam and Eve. We all came from Noah and his wife. I mean, we're descended from them, right? Those are, we're all... Physically speaking, brothers and sisters, That's right. we're all the same flesh. And God is not a respecter of person. God is not set up um, just because you're a physical descendant of Abraham. That doesn't matter. That's why, that's why we're admonished. And I'm going to close with this. In Titus chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for they're unprofitable and vain. Now, if God really cared about the physical children of Israel then we would have to care about the genealogy. We'd have to know, hey, where did I descend from? Where did my sins go? And trace them all the way back to Abraham. The New Testament says avoid genealogies. 
said they're unprofitable in vain. That's, a, that's applicable to everybody, my friend. That's not just Gentile, that's everybody. Avoid genealogies. And also in Matthew 3, verse 9, I already alluded to this earlier, the Bible says, And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Because you know what? That's what the Jews of that day believed. And that's what many of them believe today. Hey, we have Abraham to the father. That's where they're thinking their righteousness is coming from. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. It doesn't matter how you were physically descended. It doesn't matter if you were a Jew, if you're a Gentile. God has made a promise, and, and the promise was for those of faith. It's made clear. That's why the, the blessings passed on to Isaac. He was the, the child of faith. And, and it continues on to this day. Look, again, don't take this the wrong way, but, it, but a lot of people have this, this Zionist mentality that we have to do all of this stuff for an ungodly nation, for people that have rejected Christ, people that, that do not believe Moses, do not believe on God. We ought not to be supporting that nation financially, or militarily or anything. Now, if you're going to pray for anything, just pray that they get saved. <laughs> okay? Um, and, and go out and, and try to witness to them. Now, it's a hard group of, of people to, to, to crack. They're very hardened. And even to this day, I mean, you read all about the stiff neck, and, and I don't know what it is. It's kind of weird. But, but the, the people I talk that are that believe in Judaism, that are, that are physical Jews, have, have, are just really hardened to hear in the gospel. So, if you're going to pray for anything, just pray that, that they would not be so hardened and, and be receptive to hearing about Christ. But I do not believe that we, as a people, should just be praying for the peace of Israel today. Look, if God's going to bring judgment on them because, because they've rejected Him, then that's God's will, and I'm going to let that happen. I'm not going to get in the way of that. And I'm not going to pray for the blessings upon an ungodly nation. Let's borrow our time word prayer.